Good afternoon, committee members. I uh, really appreciate uh, being able to be here today at the invite of my good friend, uh, Representative Bill Taylor. Um, I did take the opportunity um, last week uh, and watched all two and a half to three hours so that I could gain an idea of perhaps some areas to fill in for you or to uh, be prepared for uh, some things that I wanted to say that, and not repeat what others had said. So um, some might call that uh, uh, torture, but uh, I don't think it was. I think it was worth it. I want to commend you guys and ladies uh, for what you're doing. Uh, I've been a part of this effort for a long, long time, and I've seen many committee hearings like this, and uh, this isn't blowing smoke at you. You guys are the most serious group that has addressed this issue in seven years, so I'm really appreciative of that. Uh, please let me um, provide some backdrop for what I'll share with you um, about my, uh, some backdrop about myself to set some context uh, for you. My wife and I live in Somerville, South Carolina. Uh, I've been living here uh, for 35 years in the state of South Carolina. I'm now a native South Carolinian for sure. 20-year um, retired U.S. Air Force veteran, uh, and then that was about 20 years ago when I retired. So uh, since then, I've been teaching constitutional law for 17 years, a year-long course to homeschooled high school kids. Uh, it's a complete uh, full uh, course on originalism, how to determine originalism, how to dissect Supreme Court cases looking for original intent in the Constitution and what has been said in those cases. Uh, I am also a published author on the subject of the Constitution in the five-volume Encyclopedia of Christianity in the United States, published in November uh, 2016 by Roman and Littlefield, and I have the area on the Constitution in that five-volume set. In 2010, I was personally requested by my friend, uh, then state representative and now United States Senator Tim Scott, to mentor him on the United States Constitution in his run for the first congressional district seat. Uh, we met on Saturday mornings at a Barnes & Noble in Nor a Barnes and Noble store in North Charleston, went over the enumerated powers that were just mentioned a few times in Article 1, Section 8 that are, and I'm complete in agreement with Ms. Uh, Martin, uh, the limitations on the federal government, absolutely. In 2013, I was the author of South Carolina Senate Bill S-308, also dubbed Restaurant Carry, introduced by Senator Sean Bennett and signed into law by Governor Nikki Haley in 2014. I'm very proud of that. I'm an ardent uh, Second Amendment uh, rights uh, supporter, and I saw a flaw there that I saw the legislature uh, haggling over, if I can be so forward with you, for probably about 10 years with all kinds of things being put in, and we tried to take care of one issue, and that was the issue of, um, for lack of a better term, the NRA dubbed it restaurant carry. Um, and we restored sec lost Second Amendment liberty in South Carolina. I know there's a lot of liberty folks in the room, so that should be of great interest to you. Uh, in August 2013, I was the very first volunteer state director for the Convention of States Project. I started the COS Project movement in South Carolina and worked as a volunteer for four years and as a full-time national staff regional director working under Mr. Mark Meckler right here uh, before leaving the effort in 2017 uh, to transfer some leadership, let some new blood come in and take it over, and also I had an ambition to go back and do some graduate work, which I'm happy to say that I'm getting close to being finished. So not to bore you with a resume, but I want you to have some context for what I'm about to tell you, uh, at least to know where I stand, what I've done, what my background is in. Uh, in no way, I remember giving a uh, briefing uh, uh, in late in early 2014, and the folks invited me to come speak at their effort, their organization, and they were sincerely opposed to the effort. Uh, and they published a picture of me with the Constitution on fire in my hands. Um, that is about the last thing. It's, it was kind of offensive. I can chuckle at it now. I'm getting a little bit older. I can lighten up on some areas, but uh, my whole life has been about defending the U.S. Constitution, either in the military on active duty or in front of students or in front of groups like you teaching original intent. So you will hear uh, today, and you have heard some already from both sides that will quote the founders and the framers quite often. It's important to go to source documents to understand history, but like everything else, context, context, context is absolutely <laughs> critical. And I hope to provide you some examples. But there are three areas that I would like to address for you. And the first one is a, uh, is an, uh, is a common fallacy statement. Matter of fact, I saw it just recently on a legislator's uh, Facebook page. And that is the, uh, the statement that goes this way. I've heard it over and over for seven years. The Constitution doesn't need to be changed. It needs to be followed. Who could argue with that? Of course it needs to be followed. I wouldn't argue with that one bit, but it displays 
If I can be so forward with you, and and I'm going to use the term ignorance, but I don't mean that to be pejorative or disparaging to anyone. Ignorance just means unknowing. I, I am totally ignorant of mixing rocket fuel. But that statement displays a, a, a huge misunderstanding and, and a deep ignorance of what is actually going on today. Uh, no, I don't think anybody in this room, for and against, would argue the fact that we want elected officials to follow the Constitution, the text of the Constitution. If you or I in this room were to go ask any of the 535 members of the United States Congress, 435 in the House to 100 in the Senate, if we were to go to any one of them and ask them, why aren't you following the Constitution? I, I venture to say none of them are going to look at us and say, uh, well, I just don't want to do that. And what they're going to do is they're going to point across the street to the United States Supreme Court, and they're going to say, they tell us what we're doing is constitutional. We could debate all day long about whether or not the Supreme Court has the authority to do that or not. As Representative Pope, I think you mentioned it there. At least this is what I got from you. But if not, then I stand corrected. But here's what I would say. Um, whether or not the, the Supreme Court is the final arbiter, Constitutionally, they are today in reality, in practicality. That's what they are. So if we're going to be honest with ourselves, we need to turn our gaze away from the legislators as all well. as much as I want to hold them accountable, and every one of us needs to do that. I think everybody in this room is probably a big activist, so probably nobody in here is a non-voter. We're all voters in here, for sure. We need to hold folks accountable. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, we need to turn our gaze across the street to that U.S. Supreme Court and ask ourselves, what in the world is going on over there? And what we're going to find is decades, if not a century, of twisting and contorting and perverting the text of the United States Constitution. Again, Representative Pope, you alluded to the uh, Commerce Clause a moment ago. Uh, Probably the most perverted portion of text in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Started about in 1942, case by the the, uh, titled uh, Wickard v. Filburn, I won't go into the details and bore you with the details of that, but it was basically the very first time that the United States Congress stretched and twisted the Commerce Clause to expand power. You know, what, I can't speak about this without bringing back to, the, to the, the biblical worldview things. And I realize that everyone in this room is not a Christian. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not supposing that or asking that. What I do want to say is take you back to where our framers got their ideas from. So in 1644, a man by the name of Samuel Rutherford wrote a book called Lex Rex. The attorneys in the room probably are very familiar with that. Uh, That's Latin for law is king. It was uh, today, we would think, not think much of that. But at that time, that was a radical idea. The prevailing political thought of the day was Rex Lex, king is law. So the idea that uh, Rutherford was actually one of the reformers, so he understood uh, the, the, the notion of the, uh, the biblical doctrine of the depravity of man or the sinful nature of man and the tendency to pull on our powers. All of us have that tendency to do that if, we are, if we're honest to ourselves in this room here today. Therefore, they set up a, a system of checks and balances. They set up a system that was enumerated powers in the U.S. Constitution um, to be able to check that. But one of those checks, that, as we're going to talk about, that I'm going to talk about a little bit more is the Article 5 process. But back to that idea of the Constitution doesn't need to be changed, it just needs to be followed. Like I said, probably nobody's going to disagree with that, except the idea of how do we fix that. I think that's what's before us today. What are we going to, what can we do about it? What are, what are the things that can be done about it? Uh, one of the other things that uh, is commonly uh, said is we don't have men like George Washington and James Madison today. Now, I've studied those guys intently. I have incredible reverence for those guys. But I also understand, again, as a, as a Christian, I understand the fallen nature of mankind. And that statement assumes a deified status of fallen human beings. If I can, I'm going to read you something in all of its context for you from Thomas Jefferson. He wrote a letter to a man by the name of Samuel Kirchival in June of 1816. So probably about uh, 30 or so years north of the federal convention. And he says, some men look at constitution with sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. Before everybody goes crazy in here, we all want to be careful what we do with the constitution. But this is what Jefferson said. They ascribe to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human. They suppose what they did to be beyond amendment I knew that age well. I belonged to it and labored with it. It deserved well of its country. So he's speaking highly of those men. 
it was very much like the present, but without the experience of the present. And 40 years of experience in government is worth a century of book reading. And this they would say themselves were they to rise from the dead. So just to encapsulate in summary, just, just to summarize that, Jeff, Jefferson is pointing out to us what we all ought to understand in this room, that there are no perfect people. I had just heard it said that there are no honorable and moral people around. Um, I mean, that was spoken to you. So, you know, take that in with what it means. So if, if I'm to understand that there's nobody on the, on the face of the, of the planet or in the United States of America that can honorably, with integrity, get in a room and look at what could be done, and there are things that can be done that I'm going to speak about in my time. But if we're going to do that, then all of us are wasting our time in here. Uh, representatives, you guys and ladies are wasting your time. We're wasting our time. We just need to fold up shop and go home if there's nobody that can be trusted anywhere to do anything. That's, and I just spoke about the fact of fallen nature of man. I'm well aware that, that we, we, we are fallen human beings and we have a tendency to pull and stretch against those boundaries uh, that are laid in front of us, and we need to understand that. But, but we uh, live in a, uh, a nation under a rule of law with a system that's set up for us to operate in. And I, and, I, and, I, and I dare say that none of you in here to believe that we all just ought to go home because you're dedicating your time and your lives to what you're doing. <clears throat> there are men like that. Uh, one of them has been mentioned here already this morning. One of the most honorable and astute constitutionalists that I know, uh, Michael Ferris, a very good friend of mine. Uh, and if his, if his record has just been besmirched just a few moments ago, but I'm not going to try to to go and correct all of those inaccuracies. His record speaks for itself. This is a man that has done more uh, for limited government in our nation than probably any three people in this room combined. Uh, homeschooling, one of the things that my wife and I hold dear as we homeschool our children, it's not for everyone, but it was for us. In 1984, that right was denied to ev to in every state in America, all 50 states. Uh, in some states, it was a little harsher, some states a little less. Today, all 50 states, due to Mike Ferris and Michael Smith starting Homeschool Legal Defense Association in 1984, uh, the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child was, um, was staved off a very, you want to talk about an amendment that would, uh, a treaty that would have taken away parental rights and parental liberty. Uh, that was it, was staved off by Mike Ferris. Well, Mike is one of the most honorable men that I know and probably uh, uh, clearly one of the men that would uh, fit in at a convention like that. Indeed, I look at the uh, resolution put forward in South Carolina, um, has the delegate selection in there. I, I am commend to you, uh, my friend Bill Taylor, and those that are co-sponsors of that bill uh, for adding a section in there that allows for two non-legislative citizens to be a part of that delegation. Calls for seven members, five to be legislators, two to be non-legislators. I intend to do everything that I can to be one, become one of those when the convention is called. I'm going to move on to something that is uh, the runaway convention. It was dressed a little while ago by Ms. Martin. I'd like to talk a little bit about it and uh, share um, what I would like to submit to you, some corrections to the record. In a 86-page Harvard Law Review article, I'm not sure anybody in this room is published in the Harvard Law Review. The Harvard Law Review is very strictly peer-reviewed by other constitutionalists. And they're not, all, uh, they're not all of the same stripe. There are some strict constructionists that are part of that. 86-page article written by Mike Ferris debunking the whole idea of the runaway convention. So a little bit of a history lesson. I don't want to bore you with a bunch of wonkish history. That's kind of my thing, but, and I realize that's not for everybody, but it's important for context. For those of you that are listening, trying to take in and understand. So a convention was called in Annapolis, Maryland in 18, 1786. And that convention was called because of major problems with the Articles of Confederation. Major. The, the Union, the young fledgling nation, was coming apart due to economic warring between the states. Five states showed up in Annapolis out of 13. Obviously not enough to do anything. But one of the things that the Annapolis Convention did in its short tenure was request another convention to be called the following spring in Philadelphia. 
And here's the call. This is the crucial thing. If you're, if you're trying to laser in on stuff that's important, let me draw your attention to this. Here is the exact wording of the call that went out from Annapolis for other states to send delegations to Philadelphia in the spring of 1787. The act from the Annapolis Convention recommends the appointment of commissioners to take into consideration the situation of the United States. And the situation was deep trouble. Matter of fact, if you, if, you, if, you, if you look at history, you'll see that even the British across the ocean were looking at their fledgling uh, uh, rebellious children across the Atlantic and uh, looking at an opportunity to come back and go take it again. It were, there was deep problems. And here's what it says. The appointment of commissioners to take into consideration the situation of the United States. Now, if you don't listen to anything else, listen to this. To devise such further provisions shall appear to them necessary to render the constitution of the federal government adequate to the exigencies of the union. That part Miss Martin left out. That's critical for you to understand today. Such further provisions as shall appear to them necessary to render the constitution of the federal government. Quick check here. Constitution of the federal government, when that statement was written, was the Articles of Confederation. To render the Articles of Confederation necessary uh, adequate to the emergency in the Union. We don't use the term exigencies much today, but that term in 1787 meant emergency in the Union. And reporting to Congress and the several legislatures, alterations and provisions therein as shall be when agreed to in Congress. Uh, I'm sorry, I skipped to another line. Adequate to the exigencies of the Union and to report such an act for the purpose of the United States and Congress assembled when agreed by them and afterwards. The, the authority that was given to those delegates when they reported to Philadelphia was to do anything it took to save the Union. Adequate to the exigencies of the Union. So this idea, and I've heard this repeated over and over and over by proclaimed constitutionalists, that the delegates exceeded their authority and there was a runaway convention because they went there and they did anything that they wanted to do. They trashed the old constitution, they created a brand new one. Ladies and gentlemen, I just read to you their charge, and that charge was repeated by the Continental Congress. So the charge was given at Annapolis, and then the Continental Congress, which called the Philadelphia Convention, exact duplicate of it with a few different words. In the, that in the opinion of Congress, it is expedient that on the second Monday of May, that's 1787, next, a convention of delegates who shall have been appointed by the several states be held at Philadelphia for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation and reporting to Congress and the several legislatures alterations and provisions, changes, amendments, tweaks, whatever we want to call them, and shall, when agreed to in Congress, confirmed by the states, render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies of the governed. And they added these words. The Continental Congress added these words. Lest anyone in this room think I'm exaggerating by the emergency in the Union, they added, and the preservation of the Union. In other words, meet next, September, meet next May and do whatever it takes to save the Union. This idea that they were supposed to go and make minor alterations, and so this is born, which is actually something that actually came up in the 60s, this whole idea of this runaway convention, it truly is a myth to you. But, I, but let me go on, because there's one other piece that's brought up, and that is the ratification process. It has been correctly put to you that under the Articles of Confederation, the ratification process involved all 13 states sent to it. Hamilton argues, and you can see this in, in one of Hamilton's letters, he argues that the plan for nine states to approve the new constitution would in fact be appropriate if the new plan for ratification was first approved by the Congress and then by the 13 states. So when the constitution left, departed Philadelphia, it had a process for ratification that included only nine states rather than all 13 states. And to, and to be quite honest with you, honest people that look at history will understand they knew it was going to be difficult to get 13 states to ratify. They, uh, there's nobody that would argue that question. There was an emergency in the Union, and they took that into consideration, and they said, we're going to, but even the, but here's how the process was legal. When the, when the Constitution left Philadelphia and went to the 13 state legislatures, not only did the Continental Congress have the opportunity to say, wait, nine states, that's wrong, it's supposed to be 13. The Continental Congress never objected to that. Then it gets to the 13 state legislatures and every single one of the 13 state legislatures, with one of them taking a little bit longer than the rest of them, or two of them, every single one of them approved that 
by sending it into an intrastate, not an interest, not, and not an interstate convention, but an intra inside the state. They sent it into a ratifying convention. So every one of the 13 states could have said, no way, we have violated this. But, but we can surmise and we can look and understand that every one of those 13 states understood that's what they needed to do. And they, since it was approved at two places, the Continental Congress, and it was approved at the state legislature level to send it into a state convention uh, to check, to, uh, to determine ratification. Another correction to the record I would like to make, and I had this decided to talk to you about before I came today, but when Ms. Martin uh, took this up, I decided this, was, uh, this, this needed to be shared with you. So Ms. Martin shared with you, and again, this isn't meant to, mis to disparage Ms. Martin, but I can do nothing else than to, than to try to explain to you and correct the record. I think that's my job here today, and others will have a chance to correct me if they think that I'm wrong. There was, a, there was a statement uh, made about James Madison decrying the idea of a, another convention. That comes from a letter written to G.L. Turberville dated November 2nd, 1788. So scholarly people go and look at context and they give you all of the quote, not half of the quote. They give you all of it and they tell you the context in which it was stated. So the date is very important. A letter written November 2nd, 1788. There was a big hubbub, Ms. Martin is correct. There was a desire for another general convention. I'm gonna call it a general convention because there was no, there had, ne there had not been an article, a convention called under Article 5 because the new constitution, the new government under the new constitution had not stood up. Remember, the constitution leaves Philadelphia September 1787. It goes out to the states. The ninth state ratified in June of 1788. That was the state of Virginia. June of 88, the Constitution is ratified. It's considered ratified. There's a big clamor, by, especially by the state of New York, to call another convention. And there, because there was disagreement and there was disgruntlement about what had happened with the Constitution. Not because of what they did for the, uh, to, to create the, the amendments that changed the Constitution. The biggest hang up was the uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, and uh, protections for individual rights being put into the Constitution. Those of us that, have, uh, that know history and have studied the history and we know that Madison uh, was, uh, wanted the Constitution ratified, so he made promises to introduce a Bill of Rights when the new Congress stood up, and, uh, and, and to his word, he did that. He did that when the, Congress, when, the, when the first Congress stood up. But with this hubbub to call a new convention before the new government stands up, Madison says the following. He says, having witnessed the, di the dangers and difficulties experienced at the first convention, no one would argue that, which assembled, which assembled, I should tremble for the result of a second meeting in the present temper of America. That present temper. The in-between period between the Constitution being ratified and the standing up of the new three branches of government that did not exist before. He says... The present temper under all, under all the disadvantages I have, I have mentioned, it is not unworthy of consideration, this is the part that wasn't read to you, it is not unworthy of consideration that the prospect of a second convention would be viewed by all Europe, here's that here, reference across the ocean again, the prospect of a second convention would be viewed by all Europe as a dark and threatening cloud hanging over the Constitution just established. So to say that that statement by Madison, who later on, espouses the Article 5 convention, remember context, 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 to make the argument that his statement then is he doesn't ever want to hold an amending convention, doesn't take into consideration why he was saying it, where he was saying it, but specifically when he was saying it, that interim period in there. We go to August 28, 1830. Here's Madison, again, the same Madison. Should the provisions, this is a letter to a man by the name of Edward Everett. Should the, and, and so context, let me back up. Let me do, be true to my word here, context. The winds of secession are whipping up in 1830. People think of the Civil War just in the 1860s, but it's starting in the 1830s. The winds of secession are whipping up. And people are writing Madison. Remember, my, Madison is his, in, in his, his golden years. He dies in 1826. I'm sorry, 1836. In 1830, he's getting letters from everybody asking because he's the sage of Philadelphia. He's, that's the reason we call him the father of the Constitution. He probably had more to do with it at Philadelphia than any other single person. He's receiving letters asking him about this and about that. And of course, the whole, the idea of nullification that's whipping up. You heard that term in here a little while ago. 
And he, this is how he responds to Mr. Everett. Should the provisions of the Constitution as here reviewed to be found close, please let me get your attention, listen closely to this. Should the provisions of the Constitution as here reviewed be found not to secure the government and rights of the states against usurpations and abuses? You have heard and you're probably going to hear from other speakers today that the Article 5 amendment process is not about usurpations and abuses. It's not about that. Listen to what Madison says. Should the provisions of the constitutions as here, re here reviewed be found not to secure the government and the rights of the states, that's our rights, against usurpations and abuses on the part of the United States, on the part of the federal government, the final resort, the final resort, according to Madison, the father of the constitution, within the purview of the constitution, and that, let me call your attention to that, that's an important principle for you to understand today, if you don't already know that. We're talking about doing things under the rule of law. We only have to us those provisions that are inside the Constitution, not extra constitutional provisions. Anarchists propose to you things to do that are outside of the constitutional text. People that believe in the rule of law first seek remedy under the Constitution of the United States. And he says the final resort within the purview of the Constitution lies in nullification. No, he doesn't say that. He says the final resort within the purview of the Constitution lies in an amendment of the Constitution according to a process applicable to the states. He is directly referring to the second mode. That's how he referred to the different sections of Article 5. He's directly referring to the second mode of Article 5. When the provisions of the Constitution as here reviewed be found not to secure the government and rights of the states against usurpations and abuses, on the part of the federal government, the final resort within the purview of the Constitution lies in an amendment according to a process applicable to the states. Unfortunately, he wasn't heeded. There has never been an Article 5 convention called today as we stand here today for all kinds of reasons. In the last 30 to 40 years, because of abject fear-mongering and cowardice. I'm going to be honest with you. Fear-mongering and cowardice. The framers would hold us in utter contempt they stood up against things. I hear today this is a risk. Ladies and gentlemen, this is minimal risk to you compared to what the risk that they took. And remember, they didn't have the rule of law. So this idea that the way that we fix it is we throw off the chains of government, that's what anarchists do. When there is a rule of, rule of law, the framers and the founders had nothing like that. That's why in the article in the Declaration of Independence, you see the enumerated uh, abuses of the king listed out. They were making a case to the world. But when they gave us the Constitution, you and I have the rule of law. Men, that, men and women that believe in the rule of law, we live under the rule of law until we have no other place to go. We still have a place to go today. So when we step outside of the rule of law, we violated, we violated everything that's under our Constitution. <coughs> Unfortunately, he wasn't heeded. I've heard it said there's, there's, uh, there's, uh, the, the states don't know how to operate in convention. That is, that is malarkey. If I can use such a word to you. There have been almost, there have been over 30 state meetings or conventions held in our nation's history. Most of them pre, uh, pre-revolutionary war, a few of them afterwards. One critical one I'll draw your attention to, 1861, the Washington Convention. Convention was called not under the auspices of Article 5. The states just called a meeting. They wanted to meet. Perhaps we would have saved 600,000 lives and the bloodshed of a civil war had the states met and deliberative. Ladies and gentlemen, you're a deliberative body. For, for people to stand in front of you and tell you that you're, that you're untrustworthy, that you're immoral, because that's what you've been told, ought to offend you. But I realize you're used to that. Legislators are used to getting bullets shot at them. I get that. But my point is, we, under the rule of law, we have a deliberative way of doing things. We try, to, we try to exercise. Is it perfect? No. Are there people that will do things that we don't like? Yes. But that's where we operate, rather than going outside. Let me share with you something about this idea of nullification. In 1798, when the Kentucky and the Virginia resolutions were written, you know how big the size of the federal government was? The size of a grape. The state of Virginia was the most powerful state in the Union, economically and politically speaking. The state of Virginia alone could have crushed the fledgling federal government like a grape. We don't live in 1798 today. We live in a behemoth, leviathan, I would submit to you, out of control federal government today. The states would be crushed like a grape. Are there some things like pot in Colorado where they nullify it? 
Who cares about that? The federal government's not going to step in and make a case out of that. How does nullification stop the, the a burdensome taxation that's taking place on the American people? The, the state of South Carolina can't go to the border and arm the border and stop that from happening. It just happens. But listen to Madison. Again, let me take you to 1834, two years before his death. He's being written about this idea of nullification. Is my time up? Because I want to get to questions, but let me share that with you. On the other hand, what more dangerous than nullification? Madison's words. Madison. What more dangerous than nullification or more evident than the progress it continues to make? It was building. Either in its original shape or in the disguises that it assumes, nullification has the effect of putting powder under the Constitution and the Union and a match in the hand of every party to blow them up at pleasure. You want to talk about destroying the Constitution? The, per the people in this room that painted a picture of me burning the Constitution, they need to take that into heart. And I will end it there. There was one thing really important, Representative Pope, and I, and I really, I want to take some questions from you. I just, one last thing, if you'll just indulge me, and that was the Article 5 simulation that was held. It was referenced a little while ago. Um, that was held. Representative Bill Taylor was one of those delegates that attended there. Uh, this is, a, I'm just going to point you to the internet. So don't take my word for it. Don't take Ms. Martin's word for it. Please, if you were convinced by that, go look it up and read the amendments for yourself. They are nothing like that were described to you. Every one of them, one of them was a repeal of the 16th Amendment. One of them was a, there were six proposals sent out in this practice, this simulation run. All of them were strict originalist type amendments. One of them was giving the states, the, uh, giving the Congress the ability, because we have, again, we have this behemoth alphabet soup agencies, usurpations that the Congress gave power to the executive branch a long time ago. We're not gonna turn that off overnight by elections. Those things are huge. One of those amendments was giving the Congress the ability, any 25% 20, of the House or 25% of the Senate, on any regulation uh, to, 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 uh, to ask for a three quarters of the sitting member's vote to hold that regulation or it goes away. 180 days the Congress doesn't act on it, the, the regulation is defunct, it goes away. There was, some, there was a term limits there, I believe it was 12, 12 years for House members, 12 years for Senate um, that was proposed. And, my point is, is that uh, the, the, and I wasn't part of the Convention of States uh, project at that time. Actually, I think I still was involved at that time. But there was, no, um, there was no manipulation done by the Convention of States. One of the things that they did very honorably was they brought those delegates in and they stepped back. A, a, a very honorable uh, originalist guy, Ken Ivory from Utah, was elected as the, the president. The rules were, uh, some rules were drafted under the, um, Auspices of Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure, which is the parliamentary procedure for 70 of the 99 uh, state legislatures today, was used to develop those rules. Uh, that's that's common, uh, common rules that were used right there. And uh, anyways, 137 delegates were sent, Democrats and Republicans. They were not handpicked. They were asked, states were asked for volunteers to do that. Uh, and there were amendments, and there were people that voted against those amendments, people that voted for those amendments, but they basically, it was very compressed, three days. But I urge you, so go take a look at that, and I can point you to some of that afterwards. But I know my time is up, and I would love to entertain questions from you. Um, members have questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Wheeler is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Menjes, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Um, I think – pull this closer. Um, as the chairman indicated in some of his questions earlier, um, you know, a lot of this is just – questions aimed at getting to the root of it. Um, we talk about how educated we may, or in my case, may not be. Um, even though I'm a lawyer by trade, I'm a country lawyer. Um, and it's been a while since I've read all the Constitution. But, um, you know, the Supreme Court could spend days debating some of these things. Um, yes, it, they're not easy answers. But I just want to try and pin down a couple things. Um, there was some discussion in your comments about the usurpations and abuses. Now, of course, that's not a requirement in the Constitution itself. That doesn't appear in Article 5, correct? correct. Um, would you agree, as, as I see it, or, or a train of thought that I have, is Article 5 essentially provides for um, two means to the same end? Yes, one through does. Congress and one through Absolutely. the states. Is that fair and to say? And to date, Congress has proposed almost 12,000 amendments. You and your colleagues, goose egg. 
and I and I and I say that only to tell you that that's a power that was given to you. The, there's a, that is the the single power left to the state legislature legislator in the United States Constitution today is the is the ability to propose. You can't ratify an amendment to propose amendments to correct things that you think are in error. And and of course there's never been any concern with the amendments proposed by Congress running away. Yes, sir. Is that right. fair to say? Fair to uh, say. Nobody's concerned about it. And the Supreme Court. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I do want to get to the root of those, those fears yes, or those, those concerns. Um, if we were talking about a, a, I think it's called plenary or, or open convention, would, would you be here espousing the same views that, that you are today? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Um, so is it fair to say that, that all these discussions are premised on the, are, are based on the premise that this would be a limited convention? Absolutely. And, that's, and again, people decry that, they mock that, they laugh at that. But again, we, I, I believe in our process. I believe in our Constitution. I don't believe in just getting angry and going outside of it. And we have a res, you have two resolutions before you, one of them by Mr. Taylor that I'm supportive of that is limited in scope to three specific, very, very specific areas. Uh, even in this, and the resolution is very, very well written, if I can say so, and this isn't just to, to puff up Mr. Taylor. Uh, there, was a, there was an original re uh, resolution in 2017 that was very much, very shorter. This one outlines uh, the, with specificity how to uh, select the delegates, but also the limitations on what that is. And what happens to any commissioner or delegate that, that wanders off that reservation is recalled, is revoked. It, it, and that was to my next point. It seems to me the more open-ended the language of the resolution, the, the greater risk exists. Yes, sir. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, and, and in fact, last week I had a question. Does, you know, there are two resolutions before us, and I don't disagree with the intent of either one of them, but one is um, much more brief than the other. Um, and didn't have, uh, at least at this point, I think the answer to the question last week was that, um, that they at least contemplated they would be having some amendments at some point that would include delegate selection and authority language, but at this point it doesn't include right. um, and, and I'll be And I'll be honest with you, and, and, and I don't mean to disparage my friends in the BBA movement because I, I am appreciative of their effort to to get an Article 5 convention called, because I think once it's called, I believe it will happen. Whether or not it happens soon enough is in, is, is in question. I believe one will happen at some point. When it's called, the boogeyman is going away. It's going to be gone. The, uh, this is the one area that I would agree with the opposition on, and that is on the BBA. The BBA prima facie, without any fiscal restraint, that is why the 3125 resolution is much more limited. Because it specifies, it doesn't specify a balanced budget amendment, but if you want to do things to fix the budget, you must attach fiscal restraint to it. Because all of us know that in our own homes, we balance the budget two ways. We either go out and earn a job that pays more money, or we, uh, uh, we, we gain more revenue that way, or we cut our own spending. And the United States Congress has never shown any propensity to cut spending. So although I'm for a balanced budget amendment, I am not for it prima facie by itself. It, it, and and I have a different set of questions I'll, I'll reserve for a later time in, in that vein. I, I certainly follow you. Um, but, but last, would you, the language of the bill or the resolution, whatever we refer to it as, um, is the fundamental restraint on whether this is limited or Absolutely. not? Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and we do have some case history to deal with. There's not a lot of case history. Matter of fact, again, I take you back to my friend Michael Ferris. I'm not just trying to toot his horn. Uh, who in this room has, artic has argued a case before the United Supreme <laughs> States Supreme Court? None of us. Who in this, that I know of? Who in this room has argued two? Who in this room has argued two and won two cases before the United States Supreme Court? Michael Ferris. One of those, uh, both of those cases dealt with limited government type issues. There was one case where the court had to deal specifically with an Article 5 issue, and, they, and the court clearly came down on the side of limitation. That's critical for you all to understand. This was a case back in 1984 and it had to do, 1982, and it had to do with the Equal Rights Amendment. Congress tried to, you may or may not recall, there was an ERA amendment sent out in 1972. It had a seven-year time limit expiration date on it. It was going to expire in 1979. Needed 38 states to ratify. 35 states ratified, and the, and the time the clock ran out. 
Idaho tried to uh, ratify that. Uh, actually, they tried to rescind. They tried. They were going to rescind theirs. But the, anyway, the case went before the, the Supreme Court, uh, went before the federal district court, Idaho versus Freeman. Michael Ferris litigated that case. Interestingly enough, at the request of Phyllis Schlafly, who before she passed was an ardent opposer of the Convention of States, uh, they were they were very close. And she asked him as a young attorney to litigate that case. They won that case in the Idaho Supreme Court. It was appealed to the United States Supreme Court, but the end result, the ruling out of Idaho versus Freeman, is that Congress has no power whatsoever under Article 5 other than to call the convention at the request of you all and 33 of your state colleagues, and then to, when the states propose amendments, they have a ministerial function to determine the mode of ratification. I heard someone last week talking about the nefarious use of mode of ratification. It's crystal clear. Two, two functions, call a convention, and then when the convention proposes amendments, again, they can only propose, it'll take a majority, 25, 26 states, assuming 50 attend, to propose one and pump it out to the states. And then Congress says, okay, state legislatures, they'll be talking to you, you will ratify in the legislature or you will do it in an intrastate convention. And it was mentioned last week by Mr. Enns, uh, he astutely covered this, that uh, out of our 27 amendments, only one where Congress has ever directed the states to do it through an intrastate convention, and that was a repeal of prohibition. Historians speculate on why they did it that way. Uh, my guess would be is I, I have some leanings, but it would be just speculation on my part. Point is, that's their, that's their function. But here's what I wanted to get in, and that was we do have case law where the Supreme Court has said that Congress's function on Article 5 is very limited. It's a state-intended function. I, I do find it interesting that we, we cite the Supreme Court when it's on our side, not so much <laughs> otherwise, as I was, I was looking, because I... I'm, not to step on you, Mr. Wheeler, I, I have a question in that, in that same vein. As I look at Article 5, and again, you may have just answered this question, it may be case law, I see Article 5 says either Congress is going to call a convention for proposing amendments or the states can, right. based, based yes. on this procedure. Um, whether it's you or I want to be respectful to other speakers' time, um, all this limitation and, and how you can confine it, I, I don't see that in Article 5. I'm assuming what I just heard you say, the, the Supreme Court has fleshed that out much like we talked earlier, like they've done on the Commerce Clause. Or they've done, the Supreme Court has interpreted that to be so that we have the authority. Because my question is this, you said that, that we could send delegates and they could come back. Okay, I'm from York County, we've got 124 members in the House. York County could call and say that the five, six York County delegation members, we don't want you involved in no, whatever we're debating. No, that's not what your resolution says. Okay, that's what I'm saying is, so you call us, say they call us back. I'm saying York County tells me not to vote in the House. Some people had that happen the other week. They walked out, the votes continued. My question is, once you, you crank this machine up and once there's a convention to, to call amendments, uh, if somebody could explain, if you call me home in South Carolina because you sent me to vote something, I was using the House example because it's simpler for us to understand. If I leave the room on a House vote, they keep voting. So what's to keep the convention from, from continuing to consider amendments just because you sent me home? The, con the, the convention could continue to, the, 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 to uh, go after those amendments. Absolutely. Again, it's a process. Sure, and, no, at some I mean, point, I'm not arguing, I'm no, trying no. to understand. No, I hear you. Yes, yes. And I'm glad you asked that question, because I want to address something Representative Long mentioned when he asked Ms. Ms. Martin a question. If I can go back to that question. And asked, I'll tell you, we're way past your time, so I'm going to let okay. you do it. Do any more members have questions before he asked you a question? You do. I, I do, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, my, and thank you, Mr. Minges. My um, concern here, and what I want to ask you about is, do you believe that the states can enact amendments can enact law on the federal government, controls on the federal government, which they are having a problem enacting on themselves. And just as my example, I'm a co-sponsor of the term limits bill here in South Carolina, it limits them to 12 years Thank in you. the House and in the Senate. And, and part of the problem that I'm seeing, like the um, Chairman Pope mentioned our meeting from last week, I saw a runaway meeting. I saw a runaway when we ignored Article 3, right. Section 20 of our state constitution, right. a roll call vote for our judges, and, we content, and the meeting continued, just steamrolled right. through. Um, that, that is my biggest 
concerned with this. How, I mean, what is your thoughts on that? On if the states can't say no to the federal funding right now, how are we going to say no when we have, have a balanced budget amendment? Again, at some point in time, you've got to, at some point in time, you've got to trust the process. Otherwise, we all fold up and go home. But your question also, is, your question also assumes something else. There's, it's commonly stated that, that they're not following it now, so why would they follow any amendments that we make? I think that's a little part of what you're asking right there. Excellent question. So the 18th, uh, the 18th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, right? Yeah. Suffrage, right? Uh, we are following that amendment to the letter today. I would submit to you that the amendments north of the 14th Amendment, because of the time it takes to stretch and twist and usurp powers, are being followed to the letter. And to say that the Constitution was perfect uh, decries the fact that we fixed a problem with human servitude with the 13th Amendment. So amendments can and will work. The 22nd Amendment, is President Obama still in office today? And this isn't, a, this isn't a shot at President Obama. The point is that the 22nd Amendment prohibits any president from serving more than two terms. And we're following that to the letter. So I've heard that over and over and over again, that we won't follow amendments if they're, uh, why would they follow them now if they're not following at all? That's, that's just simply not true. I would heartily agree that there's a lot of stuff that's not being followed in the Constitution. That's why I teach originalism. But to say the general statement that nothing is being followed simply is, a mis is an untruth. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. And my last question, how much of the federal government um, could we cut now um, would be eliminated under Article I, Section 8 of our Constitution? Uh, brother, I'm with you. <laughs> if, we, if we adhere to Article I, Section 8, uh, we would cut uh, the vast majority. But I'm convinced that the, stretch, the perversion of the Commerce Clause accounts for about 95% of the bloating of the federal government today. Absolutely. But if we were to recalibrate the text of that Commerce Clause, People say, well, they won't follow it. Of course they will. But in 50 years, it'll get stretched. And this is why George Mason said that this should be a regular process. It's foreign concept today. We're having this big discussion today, and, and people are angry at each other and hear about this. And Mason said, again, look at his quote. Don't take my uh, word for it. Go read it. I can, I can provide it for you, the whole context. Mason said that this should be a regular process. And here we are, we're, 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 we're just cowering in the corner in fetal position that we can't do anything because there's nobody honorable or moral left in the world. I'm just not willing to buy that. I'm not willing to do that to my grandchildren. Uh, I'll fight for it as long as I have breath um, to save our republic. And this is, the, the, this is the lawful, peaceful process. Not anarchy, not war. There are people in this room, I've read them on Facebook. They want a shooting war. They'll probably be the people you'll never find in a shooting war. But that's what they want. <laughs> Okay? I, this is a peaceful, lawful, and la constitutional process, not something outside the Constitution. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it, sir. Thanks. 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 Uh, go to conventionstates.com, press the button, sign the petition. More importantly, get 10 of your friends to do the same. When you sign the petition, then that sends a letter to your state legislator. You go on the list in their district as a supporter. We deliver those. It lists to the state legislators, it means something to them.